wanted to, to kind of preface this. The, the image that you guys all see on the screen in front of you is, uh, is very dramatic. Um, it's a beautiful image, but uh, we're, not, we're not all doom and gloom here. So this presentation isn't about uh, scary things. It's about uh, preparation for uh, a potential storm. So we want to talk about some different signs, some different things that don't add up. We want to give you some ammunition to talk to clients. And more than anything, we want you to prepare. So although this is dramatic and that gets a lot of eyeballs, um, we aren't here to talk to you about uh, a bear market around the corner, but we do think that there's a lot of concern and things to potentially be aware of. So our message is be aware and be cautious, um, but we're not coming out as bears right now. So I'll, I'll get into it. Right now, we're gonna have the agenda is I'm gonna talk about signs of a coming storm. So the different things that, that make us kind of scratch our heads. Um, there's a lot of information coming out there from all angles. A lot of it is now sound bites. So it's just very small headlines or sound bites. What we're gonna do here is kind of compile a few different things together um, to build a kind of a case um, that, that gives you some things to talk about with your clients. And secondly, is we're gonna talk about what the implication of that is for your clients because that's probably the most important thing over the next few years and then we're going to talk about true tactical investing that's something we've talked about for the last year and a bit um, and why true tactical investing is an important part uh, of portfolio management we found this quote uh, from chris hadfield and it really does sum up what we're talking about is is you must prepare for failure not success and i guess a, a simplified version of that is is hope for the best but prepare for the worst so he talks about kind of doing a spacewalk and all these kind of things. Um, the lesson though is, is if you visualize for failure, um, things will always go wrong and you're gonna have to know how to respond. So that's kind of what we wanted to talk about is any of these warning signs that we talk about do happen, you want a plan in place already to know what you're gonna do about it. So that's part of the conversation that we're gonna have today. And we thought that this quote was very appropriate. Um, all of the material that we're going to talk about here, any of the slides, any of the charts, any of the quotes like this, um, they're all available for, for you, the advisor. Reach out to us at SI Wealth. Talk to us. We're more than happy to share some of this information with you, figure out how best to use it with your clients. But as we go through this, we, we built this deck because a lot of advisors were asking us to. So we built this deck. Um, to allow you to talk um, intelligently to your clients, to get them to prepare for um, a, a potential worst case scenario. We don't wanna advocate it. Again, we hope everything's gonna work out, but if we're not prepared for a worst case scenario, then everything gets taken by surprise. So part of it is, is, is we're, we wanna work with you, we wanna partner. Let us know if any in this pres anything in this presentation is of interest and we'll go from there. Um, I just added this uh, recently because this was a headline from last week in the Financial Post, um, and it actually talks about the two main points of our of our presentation. The world at risk is at risk of a sudden steep sell-off in, in both the housing and the stock market, the IMF warns. Um, and this really does tie into to what we are going to talk about today um, because we, we made this... Um, we tried to add a bit of levity to the situation um, and we took the double bubble chewing gum mascot and we we rebranded it COVID-19 original double bubble and a big thumbs up to say hey everything's okay um, until it pops. So the uncharted waters part of this is that there's two bubbles and that's why we use the double bubble analogy. One is the debt bubble um, and we're going to talk about central banks and housing bubble and two is the stock market bubble. So we're going to talk about market valuation and we're also going to talk about a few warning signs that should be raising red flags with some investors. So uh, we're going to go with the double bubble analogy. First off is the debt bubble. I don't think this is a surprise to anyone. Um, central banks balance sheets have exploded higher in 2020 in order to prevent economic collapse. Um, really this has been the modus operandi for any central, any government um, whenever there's a type of crisis. So from 2008 onwards, we have just been uh, taking on more debt to solve any problem, printing more money, kicking the can down the road. Um, I remember talking about this in 2009 and 10, who's gonna pay for this? Um, and we keep on kicking the can down the road. So the big question we have here is, we're not here to predict what's going to happen. We're here to talk about these red flags or warning signs. So is this sustainable? Um, I guess we could continue to increase uh, central bank's balance sheets. 
um, but there are implications of this. And I think we're starting to see the beginnings of inflation, which, which is one of the major implications of, of constantly printing money and increasing the balance sheets of central banks. So each one of these um, uh, items, so central bank balance sheets, is we're gonna kind of have um, a little image like this, and then we're gonna do some supporting data. So the supporting data obviously is, is central bank balance sheets. The assets of the central bank, as you can see, um, on the right hand side um, of the first chart is it's everything's exploded up since 2020. So the red line is the is the US, blue is Europe, uh, green is Japan and, and orange is China. Everyone's balance sheets have just exploded in order to deal with the crisis. The question is, um, will it come down to a more reasonable level? You've actually seen them all raise, the, the balance sheets have been going up since the 2008 crisis anyways, and this has just um, exponentially increased it. The chart on the right is Canada, um, not to the same extent as the, as the major world powers, but Canada has also increased uh, its balance sheet significantly to deal with the COVID crisis. One of the questions everyone brings up is, well, what's going to happen? Who's going to pay for this? And again, if we're kicking the can down the road, maybe it's a new generation that pays for it. Maybe they're going to tax the rich. All these other kind of things um, are, 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 will impact the way that you deal with your clients going forward. And this is one of the biggest issues that we have to deal with are what are the consequences of this? Could the balance sheets be increased more? Absolutely. Um, but there is going to be an, a consequence and an impact at some point. Uh, we found this also, this image, which I, th I thought was interesting. We were very worried about the great crisis, uh, great recession uh, in 2008, 2009. The, the, uh, this is a percentage, the stimulus response is a percentage of GDP. So the small black dots is the 2008 financial crisis and the lighter blue dots is the COVID-19 crisis. So you can see in the middle, the US, almost 5% of GDP was a response to the bailouts of 2008. Uh, Canada had almost a 3% response um, versus the COVID-19, which again, dramatically increased the size of those stimulus and those bailouts and the balance sheets of all these central banks have been increased accordingly. So you now look at Canada and the US, 12% of GDP to deal with the COVID crisis and Germany at 33% of GDP. It's a bit mind boggling when you put this in perspective, the question comes is what happens on the next crisis? Are we willing to take this type of, of bailout whatever you want to call it, a stimulus or bailout. The whole point of it is we're just printing money in order to in order to pave over any type of crisis instead of actually dealing with it and kicking the can further down the road. So again, the whole point of this is there is going to be a consequence at some point. The second um, part of the debt bubble is the house price bubble. Um, we're Canadians, so the can Canadian housing market is one of the most expensive in the world. One of the major points of questions we have to ask ourselves is how much of our wealth is tied up in the housing market. Um, it's benefited homeowners. Uh, most people on this call are most likely homeowners and we've seen our, our, our house prices appreciate. We've left an entire generation out in the cold. Um, and, and what are the consequences of that? What are the implications? What have we done? Is there, is there an intergenerational transfer? Um, but at some point, if we want to realize the value tied up in our house we have to sell and someone has to buy. So one of the things we wanted to highlight this is the fact that housing bubbles do burst. We haven't really seen it in Canada and here's some of the supporting data. Uh, we pulled this from The Economist. Uh, going back to 2000 in Canada has really been one of the only markets that hasn't seen any significant decline. We've seen a steady march upwards to the top of the table where Canada is uh, real house prices are the worth more than any other country in the world. So we haven't seen any decline. We've seen maybe a slight dip in 08, but it's been more of a plateau and then a steady climb upwards. So it's great to be in Canada, um, but we also have to understand that house prices can decline, house bubbles do burst. In 2008, you can see here on the chart, US and Ireland declined significantly and took a lot longer to recover and they haven't even hit their previous highs of 2008 um, again. Germany is another example, um, has had a sideways motion for the last 20 years and only a slight uptick recently. So these are realities that affect other markets and there is no, there's nothing that insulates the Canadian market from a housing decline. So again, it can continue on up for a, another period of time and no one knows how long that's going to be. But the reality is when, when things are this frothy, when you're at the top, um, you have to start preparing for the eventuality that, that things might decline relative to other positions. So this is what we wanted to do, point out some of the um, 
the, the anomalies, some of the things that make us wonder, um, some of the things that make us question what's happening on, on, a, on a daily basis around the world and how that reflects to Canada. So our housing crisis, um, it's a generational thing. It affects certain generations and, and, and negatively and affects other generations positively. But at the end of the day, I think most people would agree that this isn't sustainable. Uh, and, and, and at some point, if you do want to sell, like I said, someone has to be willing to pay the price. All of us on the phone are probably looking at, at house prices and, and under, not understanding who is buying these houses. Um, but, uh, but that's quite, quite an interesting and I think unsustainable uh, viewpoint. This kind of gets into the meat uh, of what we're talking about all on the phone here, the stock market bubble. Um, I think there's a number of indicators that would tell us that there is um, a sort of bubble that's happening. So we understand that the stock market's gonna go up and down, but, but right now we're gonna show you some, some forwarding data that, that tells you bit of, there's a bit of a problem with market cap weighted indexes. Passive indexing has contributed to that. Um, and what we've noticed recently is that sideline money is getting back into the markets. Um, this was one of the interesting slides that we spent a bit of time compiling. It's market cap. We, we've spoken a lot. Um, SI Wealth uses uh, equal weighted indexes quite a bit. Um, and we've spoken a lot about the breadth, market breadth narrowing. So here you see the top 10 companies by market cap in the S&P 500 um, as a percentage of the market cap versus the rest of it. So over 25% of, uh, of the S&P 500 is 10 companies. And those 10 companies since the beginning of January, 2020 have returned 100, 176%. The top five companies have returned 85%, whereas the S&P 500 has returned 34%. So the story is over the last five years is if you have not owned any of those 10 companies, you've probably missed out. Um, and that's one of the, the things that we feel is a concern. Um, we think it has to be something to worry about, something to be aware of, that at a certain point during other periods of time when you have the market breadth narrow and only a handful of companies drive the market to new highs, that tends to be an indicator of, of being at the top. So we've all been there in 2000 when that was the same situation with, some, with the tech bubble. Um, and this is just something to be aware of and to have a conversation with your clients about. This has led to a huge increase in passive indexing um, because to be honest it has been very difficult to beat the s p 500 for any active managers over the last five or ten years so a lot of advisors are using etfs um, and indexes a lot of investors are using indexes because it's been very difficult to beat it so if you look at this chart to talk about passive indexing you've seen really over the last 10 years is that flow into passive equities, which is both ETFs and indexes, predominantly ETFs, at the expense of active equities. So the last 10 years, as you've seen those 10 companies, again, push the S&P 500 up to new highs, we've seen more and more people start to use ETFs. That's been a great change. Um, a lot of clients are getting more transparent portfolios for lower cost, but passive equities um, have they've all garnered this flow without a significant bear market. So all of this flow into ETFs have happened since the 2008, 2009 Great Recession. So if we do enter another bear market at any point in the future, a lot of these clients are gonna be fully invested in passive equities, which are gonna go down obviously with the market. There is no active risk management to it. Um, and that's something we wanna make sure people are aware of is you can get that exposure, but the active management, the risk management part will fall to you, the advisor, um, or ultimately the end client. So this is part of the conversation, this huge investment into passive indexing, at the same time that the S&P 500 is also pushing up the S&P 500 because you're seeing a lot of money flowing in. This leads to our next slide, which I, I find one of the most interesting ones we had, um, sideline money. So the top blue line, 569 billion, is inflows to stocks over the last five months. Now this was in April of 2021. So basically you're looking at the first five months of 2021, saw 570 billion go into stocks. And that exceeded that of the prior 12 years, which was only 452 billion. This was fascinating to me because we have all been talking about money on the sidelines. And there was a lot of people that were very bullish 
on, on stocks because they understood that there was a huge amount of money sitting on the sidelines. That is starting to now come in dramatically um, and, and that is pushing up prices. The market is, the, the, the money capital is looking to get a return and is looking to push the market up. So again, a lot of this money is going into passive indexing. A lot of this money is going into those top 10 companies. That's why you're seeing the price increase. That's why you're seeing all the indexes go up higher. Um, and that's just something to be aware of. It can continue uh, for the next six months, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, until that money runs out. Um, and once all that money is in, then, then there's no one that's going to be able to buy stocks or buy the dip. Uh, so this is quite interesting to, to make sure you're aware of is how much money has actually gone into stock markets over the last five months or, or probably year to date 2021. Um, and it's a process. It, it's, 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 a, it's a formula. The, the Fed buys bonds, the banks take that money and lend it to clients to buy stocks and quantitative easing is allowing this flow of money into the stock market. So this is kind of what we've seen and this is something to be aware of um, as a potential sign that, that it's capitulation. When the last dollar goes in, that's when you generally hit the high of the market. The problem is we still have a ways to go. The second point um, on the stock market bubble is warning signs. So is there anything about this market that makes sense? I can't tell you the number of advisors and clients I've spoken to that said, uh, my kids are beating my investment portfolio. They're buying things like GameStop, they're buying things like crypto, they're buying marijuana stocks, and they're beating my more traditional portfolio. It doesn't make much sense. So you see the Wall Street bets here and the Reddit, uh, the SPAC market. Um, are these warning signs? Are these red flags for a late stage market cycle? Oh, the answer is, very possibly yes. Um, we got a couple of data on the meme stocks. So as you can see here, this is for um, the beginning of January of this year to, to this summer. So AMC um, even currently is rated, is ranked the number one weighted position in the Russell 2000. So basically something that was on its way to bankruptcy um, is now one of the top positions in the Russell 2000. And that's because of the whole meme stock um, conversation, the, the anti-hedge fund, the uh, activist investor, uh, the democratization of, of Robinhood trading platforms, whatever you want to call it, the fact is there's a lot of irrationality going on. Uh, GameStop itself has graduated from the Russell 2000 to the Russell 1000. Uh, and what you're seeing here is just a lot of, of things that don't make a lot of sense to more traditional investors, but um, money has to be put into action and this is what we're seeing. So in addition to the meme stocks, We've seen this really on the IPOs and the SPAC market. If you look at the, the left chart, IPOs from 2000, that were almost at 400 IPOs at the height of the dot-com bubble, and combine that with late the last two years of 2020 and 21, we've eclipsed that uh, record set back in 2000. A number of those IPOs are from SPACs. So SPACs are special purpose acquisition companies. It is a company with no commercial operations. It just has to raise capital through IPOs uh, for the purpose of acquiring an existing company. So at least 250 SPACs were launched as IPOs in each of 2020 and 21. But in addition to that, we've still had an, an incredible number of companies IPO on the market as well. All this is doing is, is feeding the demand for, as that flow of money is coming into the stock market, the reason you're getting the IPOs, the SPACs, the meme stocks, is the, that money wants to find a home somewhere. So it's going to all these different vehicles and that's what the market does. The market creates vehicle to supply and satisfy the demand. Um, and that's exactly what we've been seeing going on, especially the last two years. However, please take note, be cautious, be aware that these are typically late market cycle indicators that we might have been hitting a top or coming close to hitting a top. Now, again, we have no idea how big this bubble can grow to. There is still room for growth, but there is a big, big valuation and some would say an overvaluation in the stock market at this point. So that's kind of um, important to note. This last chart was one of the, the, the best charts we found that kind of mimicked the 1999-2000 the tech bubble. Um, this is price to sales. So this is the total market cap of stocks that have a price to sales greater than 20 times. This exploded higher in 2020. So basically, 
any company that has a price to sales greater than 20 times have seen its market cap explode. So the last time this happened as significantly was in 2000, we hit a market cap of 3.6 trillion, and now we're at about 4.5 trillion. So again, this just shows that a lot of these types of companies are getting more and more capital flows into them and driving their market cap and their price that much higher. So again, um, having a look around, this is a uh, this is a warning sign. This is a red flag, just to make sure that you can prepare um, for the potential downside of this. Um, I'm not saying we know how far this goes. I'm not trying to be predictive. As you know from SIA, we follow that money flow, but we want to make sure we're prepared if things start to change on us. So just to summarize um, the double bubble again, the one is the debt bubble, which comprises of central bank balance sheets in the housing market. Two is the stock market bubble, um, and, and it's a market valuation or overvaluation. And there are a lot of warning signs if you care to pay attention. So this is what we try to just compile a few different things to be able to talk to your clients about, saying that there is risk in the system. And it doesn't mean we're telling you to get out and buy bonds. We're telling you to be prepared for when that bubble potentially could burst. Now, one of the things that we have to talk about is a couple of the triggers. Uh, so what can burst the bubble? There's a lot of different things that are out there and we've just put a list together about potential triggers, that, the, the top one being inflation. Um, obviously, we've seen the signs. There's a lot of talk about transitory inflation. I believe most people um, are are aware that inflation is probably not gonna go away and a bit of increased inflation is going to be a part of our lives. It's increased dramatically the last few months. But there is a case to be made for, for gradual increase of inflation. What we don't want to happen is a sudden spike in inflation. Um, and I think that's the job of the central banks to, to manage that as best as possible. But I don't think uh, we don't know if they have the ability to manage that. Because if inflation is persistent and it keeps on increasing, it will lead to interest rate hikes, which will affect the housing market specifically. It will affect the bond market. Um, and those could be the triggers that burst these bubbles. One of the other things we need to be aware of is demographics. Um, it's remarkable that you're looking and seeing that uh, the amount of job openings in North America that are not being filled. Um, is, that a, is that in a systematic of a larger crisis? Because as people are starting to retire more and more, um, you know, there's a lot of research out there that says 10 years ago, there were three workers for every one retiree. And the whole theory is that in 10 years from now, there's going to be three retirees for every one worker. And that might be happening a lot sooner if there's no one willing to work because the government is covering their their day to day costs. So I we believe that demographics and pension liability um, is going to be a major, major issue going forward. Um, and that could be a trigger. A resurgence of a global pandemic. Um, look, three years ago, no one even thought about this as being a trigger. Um, we've all lived through 18 months coming on two years of COVID. So now we have to understand that that's a possibility. Um, the, the other one is global conflict. There will be over the next few years, some sort of climate conflict that could lead to armed conflict. All of these in the past have been triggers um, and in the future could also be triggers. So we're not gonna be specific about it. We just are aware that all of these could trigger certain um, reactions um, that could affect those two bubbles that we just talked about. Lastly, well, almost last, is the public losing confidence in government bailouts. Uh, at what point will the public take the money, if the government does a stimulus spending, um, take that money and say, you know, I'm, I'm just going to keep it. I'm not going to keep on buying it. The government, you know, issues the money so people can continue to buy stocks and buy by other things that it's gonna help keep the whole system afloat, but what if the public loses confidence in government bailouts? Um, that could be more significant in a decline in, in the confidence level than, than most other things. And finally, political division, no compromise. It means that there's no way forward. There's no real leadership taking us to, to, to a problem solved on a global scale, um, and it might devolve into more regional or, or nationalistic um, uh, solutions that work for one country uh, at the ex at the expense of another country. So it, it's quite a long list. I'm not going to get into into the detail. We just wanted to highlight all the different potential uh, triggers that could burst the bubble. Um, but we could we could almost also see the status quo play out for the next uh, for the next while. Um, and that's the trick is figuring out where we are uh, in this cycle. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about was why does this matter to you? Um, because you as an advisor need to be able to express these concepts and ideas to your clients. So what does the next five to 10 years look like for your client? Um, one of the things that we kind of highlight is, is your target market. Every advisor's target market really is the baby boomer. 
um, because the baby boomer wealth is 12 times greater than millennials. Most baby boomers currently are anywhere from 56 to 76 years old. That's that 20 year cohort. So that does fit. I encourage you all to, to find out what percentage of your book is made up of baby boomers because you have to understand what the implications for the next five to 10 years as they all enter retirement age is going to be. All baby boomers will be 65 by 2030. That means in nine years, they will all be retirement age. And retirement means moving from an accumulation phase to a distribution phase. So, so your target market where you have your existing clients, where you're targeting clients are generally going to be in the 55, 56 plus area. Those are generally going to be baby boomers. And we want to make sure that all the different points we talked about, you can talk intelligently to them and help manage their portfolios going forward because they could be the most effective by it because really they're running out of time and time being a very interesting point is um, people are living longer so we do not want their money to run out we actually might have to need their money to last a bit longer so if we keep living longer will we be able to support ourselves now the average age lifespan is about 78 years old for women a little less for men if we keep on this trajectory in five, 10 years from now, that could increase to kind of early 80s, mid 80s. So all of a sudden they add another five year lifespan to their situation and that can continue to increase. Um, if we have persistent inflation, that is going to be a serious issue that we're going to have to deal with. So the whole point is how do we keep up? If we want to make sure we hit return targets, do we increase risk? Is there a cost to that? And the big question is how would a bear market over the next five years affect this? So this is important to understand that your clients are gonna need their money to last longer um, and, and risk is going to increase in order to get that. One of the interesting studies we found was at the same time that we might have to increase risk to hit return targets is the client risk appetite is actually going to be decreasing. This was a study that came out of Germany that had the impact of aging on risk is as clients cross the 60 year old threshold, 65, the risk takes on a negative turn. So they are really not willing to take on any more risk. So the question is, how do you get the returns like we got in the last 10 years and not increase risk going forward at a time when your clients wanna decrease risk? The problem is I don't think bonds are the answer. So this is an interesting thing um, because we've had strong, strong bull markets since 2009 um, and your clients now are, are 10, 11, 12 years older, but they want to take a bit more risk off. So it, I've, I haven't seen many advisors adding fixed income to the portfolio. I've seen them decreasing the fixed income allocation and increasing the equity side. That's great as long as we're in a bull market, but what is our plan? What is our, what is our uh, plan for failure in case we do have a bear market? How do we manage that client risk? So this is actually an interesting um, chart and we just want to make sure you're aware is clients aren't prepared to take on more equity risk as they go as they get older. This is a two part slide. Um, it was called it's the sequence of returns. And this really talks about retirement. And, and this is one of the interesting things that we had. As long as you are not withdrawing from your portfolio, as long as you're in accumulation phase, so before retirement, the sequence of returns doesn't matter. Right? This is a 25 year window. If you have the first three years are all very strong positive years and the last three years are negative versus the first three years being negative and the last three years being positive, it doesn't matter. You're gonna end up at the same point. So we just took the same sequence of returns and inverted them um, and really what you get is the same point. So this is a very important to understand. As long as you're accumulating, it doesn't matter if you lose money, if there's a bad mar mar market at the beginning and a good market at the end or a bad market at the end and a good market at the beginning. So before retirement, not a big deal. The, the issue is after retirement. So if you have any clients that are going to be retiring in the next few years, this really matters. So obviously you can see if you have a strong market at the beginning, but you're taking away 5% annual withdrawal, you will then end up with a larger at nest egg than you had at the end. So the sequence of returns matters. Now, if you had that negative return at the beginning and you're taking that 5% withdrawal, the money is depleted by year 13. This is where the issue comes. You're looking at your clients. Everyone has a specific target date that they want to retire at 65, 68, 70, 60, 55. I don't know. It depends on your client base. 
what you have to understand is the last three years, 2019, we had a strong market. 2020, despite March, we had a strong year in the markets. And so far in 2021, we also had a strong year. So you have to think about the likelihood of some negative years coming into the market over the next few years. And if that is the year that your client retires, you can't help it when they retire, but you can manage that portfolio to account for some of those different things. So that's what we wanted to have a conversation about. The sequence of returns really matters. And if a client is retiring, you need to have a conversation about what this means. We did want to highlight a couple things about bear markets. Again, we're not bearish. We're not saying a bear market is around the corner, but we do think that a lot of people um, need to understand some bear market facts. So here's a number of historical bear markets. Um, at the average, uh, you know, we talk about which market it is, the, the, the years of the bear markets, the months that they took, the absolute declines, and then in the right column was the time to recover. So on average, it takes about five to six years for the market to recover and hit the previous high before that bear market started. Um, we've got two outliers kind of that prove the rule almost and that was uh, was some took longer than the five or six years that was the Great Depression in the 20s took 25 years to recover and also in Japan and in the Kai from 1990 uh, to now and still counting it's been 31 years um, and counting to recoup where, where it was before that bear market but now especially after 2020 we have the other side of the spectrum the short bear market so as you can see here 2020 for the Dow it took nine months to recover, and in the S&P TSX, it took 11 months. So again, I believe that that's the exception that proves the rule. Um, and going forward, that average should probably work itself out a bit more to that five to six years. So everyone kind of you know, held their breath and markets recovered in 2020, but the reality is if there is gonna be a bear market going forward, you're probably not gonna get that shortness uh, that we experienced in 2020. It's gonna be probably somewhere closer to that average. So again, prepare for it. What would have happened if 2020 lasted um, another six months, another 12 months? And that's part of the conversation that we want to make sure you have a call with clients. Now, again, this is one of my last bear market facts. And this is this was very interesting. It came to light during our discussions was the double bear market, the double bubble bear market, which is an inflationary bear market. A lot of people don't talk about an inflationary bear market because inflation hasn't been a big thing. But the reality is, Inflationary bear markets can be just as devastating to client portfolios as market crashes. Um, so if you look, the first one, 1966 to 82, look, no one was, was an investor at that time, probably. Um, but during that 16-year window, the Dow returned about you know 1%, so it was kind of flat. But inflation increased over 300%, which gave you an inflation-adjusted return of negative 67% during that six-year window. Again, very, very destructive to portfolios. We also had an inflationary period closer to home, which was 2000 to 2011. Um, and I do understand that there you had, you had two bear markets in there, which is a 102 and 2008. However, that was also an inflationary period where the inflation increased by 134% during that 11 year span. And if you stayed invested, the Dow gave you a return of negative 5%, so more or less flat. Um, but you had a real in, in inflation adjusted return of negative 25% during that period. So this is something to be aware of. If we are starting to see inflation raise up and it is more than transitory, this is something that we need to be aware of. We could have an inflationary bear market. So one of the things uh, from a proper portfolio management point of view is we do want to manage and talk about the worst case scenario we want to talk about the black swan we want to prepare for it we hope it doesn't happen we hope all sorts of things can sort themselves out but if we don't prepare for the worst case scenario we're not doing our clients a, 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 as good a service as we want so the worst case scenario from this scenario i just put is if inflation rises over the next few years while asset value stocks and houses go down so then you have that double bubble popping. You have inflation um, potentially you know, decreasing the value of their money while the, the, the asset value is actually going down. So it, it could be um, two headwinds against some of our clients. And especially if they're entering into that retirement phase, this is the biggest time to be prepared and to manage as best as possible. So what if this happens and your clients are living on a fixed income? The important thing is to have a conversation with anyone retiring over the next five to 10 years and talking about how to prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. And that's really the, the summary of what we wanted to do today in this presentation. 
Um, I'm going to talk, I know I've been talking for a while, I'll take about three minutes to talk about true tactical investing and why it matters now than ever before. This is really what SIA does. This is how we manage our portfolios. Um, briefly, I want to talk to you about true tactical. This is why we believe everyone needs to have a tactical sleeve in the portfolio and true tactical, especially because that will have the ability to go from 100% equities all the way down to zero. This makes it very different from a lot of clients. We're trying to manage that true tactical ability and manage it as best as possible. A question we ask every one of our advisors is what is your tactical range? Um, if that one of those bubbles pops, if something starts to decline, what is your ability to move from 100% invested to 80, to 60, to 50? How much do you want to go? Is it all dependent upon you? Um, did you act in March of 2020 to reduce that equity exposure? Um, if not, this is a conversation for, for us because we, we are true tactical. We are more tactical and in March of 2020, we went completely to cash um, and we eventually got invested back in. But the whole point is we did what a lot of clients asked us to do which is take that risk off so it's an automated process there's no emotional there's no subjective there's no person making that decision we follow a process and that process really is looking at global money flows money flow doesn't leave money doesn't leave one place without finding a home somewhere else so as that money is moving around and equity markets are going up we're going to be invested in equities but as that money starts to leave and go to places like fixed income uh gold um and some other safe havens that's when we'll start to exit those equity positions we use relative strength for that so there's probably people on the call who are new to sia relative strength is when you we compare the price of any stock or ETF or sector or index against every other stock, ETF sector index. So what we're doing is we're comparing the price of the US index versus Canadian index and trying to determine where the money flow is going. If the price of US is beating that of Canada, more money is going to the, towards the US market and that's where we're gonna be exposed to. We do the same thing for sectors. Where is that money going? Is it moving from technology towards energy? Um, and then we go down to the individual stock and ETF level. So we're gonna allocate our money to either Apple or Walmart, depending on whose price movement is greatest. So SIA Wealth uh, utilizes the SIA Charts uh, platform to compare stocks and ETFs. We look at a universe of 5,000 stocks and ETFs every night and run two, 25 million comparison charts in order to determine where the relative strength is. And this allows us to allocate our portfolios to the strongest areas. One of the things I wanted to highlight is we've been managing a fund for BMO Global Asset Management for the last six years, and we want to put our money where our mouth is. We are truly tactical. As you can see on the right-hand side of this chart, in March of 2020, our system indicated a red indicator, which tells us that we were selling all of our equities. We went from a 99% exposure to equities all the way to 100% exposure to fixed income. So we took all equity risk off the table. We got back in once the market started to bounce. But again, if that bear market is lasting three months, six months, 12 months, longer than, <laughs> than the six weeks of this bear market, we would have stayed and taken that risk off the table. So where, where this makes sense for a client portfolio is the call to action. We are telling our clients and advisors to add a 20% true tactical sleeve, especially going forward. If you believed any of those warning signs we spoke about at the beginning, adding a true tactical sleeve is very important right now what it does first it automates your asset allocation so we right now are are overweight equities we're exposed to equities um, most of our equity mandates have about a 75 to 80 percent exposure to equity so we're much overweighted so we're participating in the market growth right now but we have that ability to rotate out of equities and go to zero so if you have a typical 60 40 portfolio and you had 20 percent in a true tactical sleeve when that risk comes on we take it off the table your 60 40 client goes to 40 60 and you haven't lifted a finger you've bought an, an automated tactical asset management sleeve in your portfolio and this is really where we've seen a lot of success with a lot of advisors using it and it's a great conversation and to have with clients um, a lot of advisors also use this as an alternative strategy so we're not trying to be a hedged or uncorrelated really what we do is uh, we are a long flat strategy we are long equities when we're favoring equities but we have the ability to go to cash when equities are out of favor so that really gives us a nice benefit from an alternative point of view and a lot of advisors use an alternative sleeve with us as a component of it. And finally, this is a complementary strategy. It is not contradictory to a lot of your long-only positions, whether you buy managers or ETFs, 
there is a lot of long only positions because the last 10 years have benefited long only strategies. Um, and this is what we're talking about. We are benefiting because during periods like right now, we are overweight equity, so we will participate in the equity market run up. But the whole point is we will, we will rotate that out. You can then choose to unwind some of your existing long only positions, but you've already had a risk management um, sleeve in your portfolio. So this is really how we're working with advisors. If any of what I've just said uh, resonates, uh, we want to have that conversation with you about talking about this. So. We do have a partnership with BMO GAM. Um, it's a great partnership. It's benefited us uh, tremendously. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details here. I've been talking long enough, but here's some of the fun code and information. If there's any of these slides uh, that you're interested in finding out more about, if you wanna get them to use for clients, please feel free to reach out to us at SI Wealth. If you wanna have a conversation about any of these funds, feel free to reach out to your BMO, um, BMO GAM salesperson, uh, more than happy to have that conversation. But uh, we just wanted to make sure to let you know that, you know, we, we, we're trying to get an awareness. We're trying to have you resonate with your clients. This whole fear of missing out situation in the markets is, is something of concern. So if any one of these types of situations happen, all we want you to have to, the, the ability to do is prepare for it. Prepare for the worst, understand what the worst case scenario is, but hope for the best. We all believe that markets are gonna go up and this, we could sort ourselves out of this mess, but a lot of people think that the, the, the economic outlook and the way markets are operating for the next five to 10 years are gonna be significantly different from they are today. That's why you joined in on our call and I wanna thank you for your time and attention. Um, feel free to reach out to us if there's any questions. I apologize, I'm not gonna get into the questions right now. Um, I've been talking for quite a while, so thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna leave it here and have a great day, everyone.